All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming to the late track, the last track of the day session. We appreciate it. Uh, this is the OTTL cookbook. My name is Tyler Hummuth. I'm an engineer from Honeycomb. I'm Evan Bradley. I'm an engineer from Dynatrace. So first, I need to show of hands. How many people in here have used OTTL before? OK, pretty good number. All right. Well, I see that there weren't some hands up, and I'm going to assume that's not because your arm's cramping. So first, uh, I'm going to cover what we're going to cover today here. And first, we're going to get into what the collector is and how OTTL fits into that, just so that everybody's up to speed. After that, we're going to solve a couple of scenarios with OTTL. Um, we have the recipes as part of our cookbook, and we're going to frame them using these scenarios. Um, so we hope you'll enjoy those. And then to show OTTL's flexibility, we're going to take your scenarios, and then we're going to do them live. So we hope that you've brought some or that you can think of some throughout our presentation. So just to get started here, the Open Telemetry Collector is an observability pipeline middleware that can import and export data in all sorts of formats. And the user can control the flow of data as it goes to the collector. And the collector owes this to its pipeline model, which is based on a custom like internal version that it, or of data that's based on OTLP. Um, and this is particularly useful with processors. So processors are able to work on data on this internal representation without having to worry about what the data is going to look like going out or how it looked coming in. And this is going to be the focus of the presentation today. Um, OTL usually comes in at the processing stage. In particular, we're going to be focusing on two processors in the collector, the transform processor, which can edit data in place as it travels to the collector, and the filter processor, which drops data from a pipeline. So what is OTTL? OTTL is a DSL that is custom built for the collector, really fast, really flexible. It's probably the most flexible way to modify data inside of the collector. And it owes this to a couple of properties. First, you can access any field on the OTLP payload, so any data coming into the collector, OTTL is going to provide some way of providing access to this. Second, since it's a programming language, you are given a degree of expressiveness that might not be present in something like a YAML config. Um, and we've made the syntax just complex enough, hopefully, to do all, the comp or do all the transformations that you would like to do without making it overly complex uh, and difficult to use or read. One other thing that I want to call out is that the OTLP data model is hierarchical. So let's say you're emitting a bunch of logs, and these logs are probably coming from an application, right? Well, you can put the application's name on each of the logs so you know where it comes from, but that's a lot of data duplication. So OTLP tries to be smart about this and has this information on a resource. So if you have these 50 logs, the 50 logs would all be associated with the resource, and the resource would have that as like a list of logs under it. This creates a little bit of complication when you're doing processing, but as we'll see later, OTTL can handle this, and the uh, speed gains that you get are worth it. All right, it's time to start going through some examples. Uh, as we're going through these, uh, hopefully it sparks some ideas. You can come up and give them to us at the end. Uh, some of these are pretty complex. If, if we end up going a little fast, don't worry. All of these slides are up on the session page. You can come ask us questions. We'll be at the Hotel Observatory the rest of the week, so we can help describe anything that gets missed. So for this first example, we're going to uh, process some unstructured MySQL logs. These logs only have a body right now with the, the text inside, which means they're not taking advantage of OTEL's structured nature, and we'd like it to. Uh, we want to uh, extract the values, some values out of the uh, log body, and to do that, we're going to use the following recipes. Uh, we're going to set some OTLP log fields. We're going to parse and extract values from an unstructured log body. We're going to conditionally set some values, and we're going to update an OTLP resource. So the first thing we want to do is to set the severity number and the severity text for this log. We know that the log body in its text doesn't have anything that represents severity, so we're going to choose to classify all of these logs as info. Setting a value is the most basic but most common action to take with OTTL. We do this using the set function. It takes as its first parameter the field being set, and the second parameter is the value. OTTL provides paths to each field in every signal of OTEL. So you'll always have access to the field that you want to use. In addition, OTTL also supports enums. So in, if you want to keep the statements nice and readable, you can use something like severity number info instead of the number nine. Next up, we want to extract the interesting field query time 
from the log body and put it into an attribute. We do this using a combination of functions. First, OTTL has the function extract patterns, which uses regex capture groups to extract values from a string. In this particular scenario, we pass it in that log body and our regex, and it returns a map from the named capture group and that captured value. That returned map is then piped in as the second parameter to the merge map function, which takes in as the first parameter the log attributes. That map is the second, second parameter, and it merges it in to the log's attribute. The result is that that query time parameter that gets extracted out of the body ends up in our logs attributes for use later. We call functions like extract patterns converters, and they're really helpful to keep complex transformations into one statement. Next up, OTTL supports conditions, which determine whether or not a function is executed. In this statement, we only want the new slow attribute to be added to the logs attribute map if the query time attribute, which we extracted in the last scenario, is if it's greater than 0.7. With this condition, only logs that have that slow query time end up getting this new attribute. It acts like a gate. Although this is a really simple condition with just one Boolean expression, OTTL does support ands, ors, not, and grouping if you need them. And finally, we want to set a static resource attribute to represent where these logs came from. In this scenario, we're saying all the logs came from the same place, so this is the perfect, the resource is the perfect place to put this type of information. We can put it on the resource attributes instead of the log attributes, and this saves us bytes on the wire as we don't have to duplicate that information across every single log. Here's what it looks like all put together in the transform processor. First, for each resource, we set that new attribute, and then for each log, we run the four statements. All four statements are executed from top to bottom in order for each log, and then we move on to the next log, four statements again, and it loops through each log. The result of all of these transformations is a log with newly set severity, some new attributes, a nice resource attribute, and that body text is left intact. All right, so let's take a look at another log example, this time using a JSON body instead of an unstructured body. So let's say that we have logs that have a stringified version of the body that you see on the right here with most of the fields under that object key. We want to parse this log and then take these fields and put them on the structured OTLP log. So what we're going to show here is how to parse a JSON log and then how to work with fields such as timestamps, tracer, span IDs, or manipulation of strings. Thanks. So let's start with parsing the body. So we have the body. It's that uh, stringified JSON that we talked about. Um, and what we want to do first is we're going to parse that, and that's going to turn that from a string into a map. And OTTL can index maps. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the object key out of there. And that itself is a map that we're then going to merge into something called the cache. So the cache is a map type a path in OTTL that allows you to, as the name would imply, cache values between statements. So something like parsing JSON, we don't want to redo this on every statement, so we put this inside of the cache, and then the cache is cleared after the group of statements, so you don't have to worry about any kind of cross-contamination of state. So again, what we're going to do here is we're going to get that object uh, map out of the, the body, and then we're going to merge that into the cache, producing the result that you see on the screen here. So now that we have all of the information we want to work with inside of the cache, we can get to getting that information onto the log body. So first, we had that long JSON string before. That's not going to look great in our back end. We want just the log message. And that happens to be inside of that JSON object. So we set it on the body. Next, we have timestamps. And these are in a string format. And we know this format. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a format specifier string and our time function. And we're going to parse this into an epoch time, which we then set on the time field in the log. And this can be shown however you like in your back end. Next, we're going to associate the log with the span and trace uh, according to the IDs that have been set in that JSON object. And while the trace and span IDs are normally integers kind of underneath the hood, um, OTTL provides these string subpaths, which allow you to work with these as hexadecimal values. So this is really handy because that way you don't have to do the conversion yourself, and OTTL can handle it. So we got these IDs as hex strings inside of this JSON, and all we need to do is set these onto that string path, and then it will do the conversion into the integer for us. 
Finally, we want to put an item name attribute on these logs. So we've got a brand and an item, and we want these to be a single attribute, and then we want to make sure that it's case insensitive. We just chose uppercase. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a uh, series of function calls, and we're going to nest those. OTT allows you to do this so that you don't have to do these across multiple statements. So first, we're going to concatenate the brand and the item with a hyphen, and then we're just going to set it to uppercase and set it onto that attribute. Fairly straightforward. Put together, it looks like this. Uh, as we covered, you parse the JSON body, you get that object key out of it, put that into the cache, and then you set all those fields on the log, and you're good to go. All right, let's move on to a metrics example. In this scenario, we've got some applications producing metrics following different semantic conventions. We want to normalize this data so that it all looks like the stable semantic conventions for HTTP when we're using it. Uh, we're going to scope it down to just transforming the HTTP request duration histograms, but you could use OTTL to normalize all the data if you needed to. To bring these old style histograms up to the latest semantic convention, we're going to have to normalize the metric unit, which means scaling all the data points, normalizing the metric name, and the some data point attributes. The recipes we're going to use for this are some reusable conditions, uh, how to rename an attribute, how to scale a metric, and finally, how to rename a metric. To start, we want to make sure that we do these transformations only for those two scoped down metrics, uh, specifically the HTTP client or server duration metrics, which is the old style name. To avoid duplicating these two conditions across every statement, we can take advantage of this convenient condition block in the transform processor config. This is a uh, list of Boolean expressions, like a where clause, that are ORed together. If any of these conditions are met, then the statements below get executed. The first recipe we're going to follow is how to rename an attribute. Uh, to, to do the first part of the rename, we use set. Again, it's the most common thing that we do. We set a new attribute with the new name, and we use the uh, old attribute's value as the new value. We don't want that old attribute key or its value around in the data point attributes map anymore, so we use delete keys to remove the key and its value from the attributes map. Next, we want to adjust the metrics unit, which also means scaling all of the data points for that metric. Scaling histogram is trickier than scaling a sum because it's not a single digit, it's got buckets, but luckily we have this convenient scale, uh, scale metric function, which can take in a scale factor optionally a new unit, and then it takes care of setting that new unit and doing all the mathematics on all of the data points to get the scaling done. And then finally, renaming a metric. Again, we're just going to use set. We take the name in as the path. We set the new value. And then, of course, we want to do it conditionally based on whether it's the client or the server. This is what it looks like all put together. Like our first example with logs, we're taking advantage of OTTL's ability to work on multiple contexts in this, in this part, uh, specifically the data point and the metric context. In the first part, we're working on data points. We're only working on data points that are for the metric that we care about. We set the new attribute and remove, we remove the old one. One thing I want to call out is that in that conditions, even though we're working on data points which don't have a name, we're able to reach up into the metric associated with that data point get its name, and then do the check. This is because OTTL understands the hierarchical nature of OTEL data. It knows that a data point is associated to exactly one metric, one scope, one resource, and you're able to access those fields. In the second part, we're transforming the metric. We handle scaling all of, or setting the new unit and then scaling all of the data points all within that function, and then we set the new name. All right, so let's take a look at another metrics translation example, this time using Prometheus. So one thing, or two things that I want to call out here. One, we're not Prometheus experts, so this isn't necessarily a recommendation on what to do when translating Prometheus metrics to OTEL. And two, this is a fairly convoluted example that is deliberately intended to show how OTTL can be used to force data into the shape that you want it in, uh, even if it requires some clever workarounds. So if you don't totally follow this, it's okay. Uh, the key takeaway here is the flexibility of OTTL and not necessarily that this is the absolutely correct way to do something. However, uh, we're going to show a couple of interesting things as part of this. Um, the, this is kind of a modified example of a real-world example of scraping a message queue's endpoint and then taking those metrics and making them more OTEL-friendly. 
So we want to re dynamically rename the metric without having to explicitly enumerate each metric that we want to cover. Uh, we want to do an aggregation inside of the collector, so do that before it reaches our back end. And then finally, we want to restructure the metrics payload a little bit, so we have a uh, information metric about our cluster that we want to get the metadata for onto all of the metrics in the payload. So let's first start with renaming. So our metrics all have this MQQ prefix, and the words in this are delimited by underscores, but in OTEL, typically, periods are used. Um, so what we want to do here is we're going to use a regular expression just to dynamically rename any metric that starts with this MQQ prefix and turn this into periods. Note here that the rest of the metric name, so anything that's not in the prefix, keeps that underscore. So the published total will maintain the underscore despite the fact that the uh, prefix has been changed. Next, we're going to do an aggregation. And so we have this queue published metric, and this shows the number of published messages for each queue that a particular node handles. But we want to aggregate these into all of the messages that have been published from this node. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a copy of the queue published metric, and we're going to create a new node published metric that's inside of the same payload. So basically, you just append to the metrics list, and you keep the metric, all of its data, and then the data points and all of their metadata. And we're going to aggregate these next. So the aggregation is fairly simple. You can call the aggregate and attributes function. We want to sum the values for all of the published messages in the queue. And we want to keep that node attribute because we want the published messages per node. And we're going to do this just for that node published metric. So what it's going to do is it's going to take those three data points. It's going to get rid of that queue attribute. So that's no longer a dimension for the values. And it's going to sum up each of the one messages per queue into three messages for that whole node. Next, what we want to do is we want to take a cluster info metric that has a single data point with all of the cluster information. And we want to get this onto the resource so that it applies to all the metrics. So what we need to do here is, since in OTEL, the metrics themselves don't have any attributes. These all are included in the data points. So since um, attributes are used as dimensions in data points. So what we need to do here is we need to go down into the data point uh, context. And we need to loop through all the data points until we find that data point for the cluster info metric. After that, all we need to do is copy its attributes onto the resource attributes, which will make it apply for all of the metrics in the payload. Since we don't need that metric anymore, what we're going to do now is we're going to use the filter processor to go find that metric by its name and then just remove it from the payload. Put together, it looks like this. Inside of the metrics context, we rename all the metrics. We do that aggregation. Uh, and then we reach down to the data point context, pull up the cluster information onto the resource, and then remove that unnecessary metric. All right. We, I made another example, but I want to do a quick time check because we're getting close to the, my 10 minutes, and I wanted to give enough time for everyone to give examples. Enough people raised their hand that kind of understood OTTL. Can you raise your hand if you're planning to, to come up here and give us an example? If you are, then I will pause here. OK, we didn't get too many, so I'm going to just keep going. All right, uh, last example. Our spans have some attributes uh, that all share the same prefix. And in this scenario, we want to reorganize these attributes to be nested under a new value altogether with that prefix removed and uh, the prefix used as a, as a key for the new attribute. This is some, what we call this dynamic attribute manipulation uh, or bulk attribute manipulation. And it's a little tricky when you only know the prefix and you don't know the rest of the value. It's, you can't use static values in order to do manipulation. Uh, instead, you have to group related attributes. That's the recipe we're going to use. And it's a little complex, so we're going to do four required steps. Step number one is to duplicate the attributes into the cache. We need the data duplicated so that we can mess with it. Uh, and we're going to do that in the cache. Step number two is to remove what we don't want from each map. So we use delete matching keys to remove all the attributes with that prefix from the actual attributes map. This removes all those prefixed attributes and leaves the attribute map with everything that was left over. That's OK. We already duplicated all the data, so it's safe. We're going to add it back in a future step. We do the opposite function, uh, keep matching keys for the cache map. In this case, we pass in that prefix. It drops any attribute that doesn't match that regex, which means the, the cache map ends up being only those attributes we wanted to do manipulation on. 
Step number three is to move that prefix. We use replace all patterns, which can do bulk manipulation on keys in a map. We pass in the cache, which is holding all of those prefixed attributes. We tell it to work on keys instead of values. Give it that prefix and the empty string as the replacement value. It matches the prefix, replaces it with an empty string, same as removing. And then finally, we take that cache and we use it as the value for the new attribute. Hotel supports maps as attribute values, so we don't have to do anything special. We can pass the cache in, it copies the values over, and we get our new attribute. Here's what it looks like all put together. We set that cache, which duplicates all the attributes. We remove everything that we don't want from each map. We remove the prefix from all those attributes left over in the cache, and we set a new attribute. All right, that was all of our curated examples. Uh, we're gonna go over we're going to transition now into doing some of your examples live here on stage. Uh, I really hope you bring some. If you don't, uh, we have some that we'll just type out on stage. A uh, couple rules for examples if you give them. Uh, first, no stateful transformations. OTTL doesn't have any common functions that support stateful transformations. So uh, no tail sampling, no metric conversion stuff like cumulative to delta. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, no cross-signal transformations. OTTL is really strict with how it accesses the underlying payloads. So you can't turn a log into a span. If you need to do that, look at connectors. It's a special component in the OTTL collector that can handle that kind of stuff. And then finally, no profile transformations. You may have heard some profile stuff today. OTTL is getting really close to stable support for profiles. Uh, the collector is working on it, but we just don't have support for it yet in OTTL. Uh, if if you bring us an example and it's really hard and we take too long to solve it, we don't want to get stuck on it, so we're just going to transition to the next one. Uh, you can come find us at the Hotel Observatory. We'll try to solve it with you there. When you're given uh, examples, try to keep it succinct. We'd only need the what, not the why. We don't really need the context behind why you needed this transformation. Uh, we're not going to run data through any of these. We're just going to make claims that they work, so just give us the what you need done. Uh, we'll upload all of the transformations we write to the session page. So don't worry about taking super detailed notes or anything. All of these statements will be accessible at the end of the session. And then finally, we're still going to do a Q&A. So if you have questions related to other OTTL things, but not to this exercise, save them for then. Uh, and with that, I'll open it to the floor to come test OTTL and see how flexible it can be. All right, that worked. Okay, uh, okay uh, this was great, thanks. I'm definitely going to use the slides <laughs> in the future. Uh, just yesterday I had an issue that I, again, wasn't able to solve with OTTL docs, and so maybe that some work is needed on the documentation, but I wanted a very simple thing. I wanted to know if log body has a string in it, a specific string in it. So it's the, I think the question I heard was, how do I check if log body is a string before I do a transformation? Okay, we can do that. We do a statement, like we'll just set an attribute, test, pass, and we have a function called is string, and you can pass it the body, and it returns true if the body is a string. I want to see if there is a specific string in the body, if there's info in the body. Oh, okay. Uh, if, if you want to check if there's a specific string in the body, we could also do and is match, uh, pass it the body, and then whatever string you were looking for, like if info is in there. And that's, that's okay. using regex, essentially. Just regex. Okay. Yep. Uh, so it can handle <laughs> complex, it's, it's restricted to Go's regex, so no negative look-aheads, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, any sort of regex that Go supports, you can do with that. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know why I didn't find it, but yeah, thanks. I'm definitely going to use it. <laughs> I think also we don't actually need this because this match will handle conversion. I so think you can just do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I think it'll handle Hey, time for one more? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for, for the talk. Uh, I want to to be able to dynamically uh, define the labels that I want to collect from uh, a resource. So let's say we have a resource detection, and 
that gets a lot of labels. And I want to apply some of those labels to the metrics, but I want to do that dynamically based on each metric. But I don't want to do that in the collector. I want to do that into my code. So I want to send something like a metadata saying all of the labels that I want to keep, all the infrastructure labels that I want to keep, and I want to, the collector to see that and just apply and just keep those infrastructure labels that if it found on that, let's say, metadata tag. I don't think I was much clearer, but. I, I don't know if I totally follow the scenario. I'm, my guess is that it's doable with some combination of the cache replace patterns, um, but I, I don't think I quite understood what you're asking. Do you want to take a stab at it? I'm not. Can you speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Unfortunately, the speakers are facing away from us. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that's you, Frank. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much want to dynamically select the labels uh, to apply to a specific metric, uh, but I don't want to do that directly in the collector. I want to be dynamic from the code. So the, the, the metric that is emitting the metric the code that is emitting the metric defines what, what are the infrastructure labels that it wants to keep uh, when it gets to the collector. I don't, I, I don't know enough about the oh. SDKs to answer that, unfortunately. Yeah, this is, right now, Otatail is only supported in the collector. So if you wanted to do something in your application, you could pull in Otatail. It is a library. It's, it's tagged and available for use. And you could, you, I you see. might be able to do something like that, but th it's typically used for users to express transformations when they're not in the code. When you're in the code, you've got a lot of tools available to you that, like regular PData or something, you probably might not need OTTL. Let's talk about this one after. Yeah, sure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I have a use case. Um, can you extract the timestamp from the log or metrics and then change from one time zone to another? Yes. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase some of the functions because I don't have them all memorized, but the answer is yes, we can change time zone. So it would be something like, uh, do you want to do the log timestamp or the observed timestamp? Uh, both. Okay. I'll start with just the timestamp. It would be something like time, um, and it would be, I think our time converter can handle switching the time zone. I don't really want to pull up the function, uh, the functions. I know it, the timestamp will come in as a time object, and so you can convert that. You can get the hour off of that. Yes. You could get the hour off of it. If it's already in, if it's already in epoch time, we could do, you can convert it into, I mean, I'll say this. The time function that we showed earlier, this is how my brain is thinking right now, so I'm just going to write it this way. Um, there is a function to turn the, to take the time and turn it into a UTC time. I think it's like this. And then you would pass it your format and the new time zone, whatever that is. Uh, that's a really roundabout way to do it. We might have a function that's just on a time set time zone, and I don't remember. <laughs> if we don't, that would be a really good issue. Uh, and if anyone's coming to ContribFest later for open telemetry, uh, a function like that would be a really easy first contribution. Uh, so if you're interested in contributing to Otel, come to the ContribFest on Friday, and maybe you can contribute a, a function like that time zone if we don't have it. Yeah. So yeah. is it possible that if we deploy the same code to the different region and you can dynamically uh, identify the time zone and change accordingly? Yeah, this, this, time, this time function supports locality and time zone. That was a feature added in the last two months. Um, so I think the answer to what you're saying is yes. Thank you. Yep. I'll, I'll make sure that this one's true before I upload the slides. <laughs> <laughs> hey there. Hey. Hey, I got one more. Um, so. I was kind of involved in this, uh, but I just wanted to clarify uh, 
replacing a substring with a hash based on a regular expression, is this something that we can, uh, you know, uh, that we declare support for, or there's something, some work to be done there? Uh, yeah. Replace a substring with a with, hash? Yeah, with a hash of, of a replacement string, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it in so replace pattern? Is it replace only? pattern. Okay. Replace, replace pattern. pattern. Yes. Replace pattern. Uh, let's say we're doing the attri some attribute. Uh, we'll just keep using test because that's a good one. Um, it takes in you the, need the. You have to have a capture group in there. Yeah, we got to do. We'll just do everything. Dot star. There you go. We need the yep. capture group. Uh, so it's in parentheses. This is. No, no, no. This is just a string. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the replacement value, isn't it? Like dollar sign, dollar sign one, and then mm -hmm. you pass it in. To you pass it SHOD in. 256, yeah, for SHOD example. 256. But you want in the regex, you want the capture group. In this regex? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Of the, course, the, yeah, yeah. It's got to be the like this. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, so this function, this this statement uses a function called replace pattern. It takes in a single string. In this case, it would be the string pass, I guess. Uh, matches a regex, uh, in this case, everything. Uh, that capture group is referenceable as the new value. Uh, and when you, p when you add this optional parameter, which is a function, it will pass this value to this function executed, and that's what ends up getting set. Right. I have a question around this, maybe in the, uh, later in the ob observatory, yeah. I didn't catch that. What'd you say? Uh, in the observatory, I have a question around this, about the replacement behavior. OK. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Uh, let's do one more. Um, I don't have use case, but I want to ask, you write a, um, the statement, how would you recommend us to troubleshooting? Because I write it, but yes. I don't know how to yes. verify. That is a really, really, really good question. Um, there are. Two things to do. Uh, the first is the transform processor, the filter processor, really everything in the collector, especially think like OTTL, is utilizing P data under the hood, which is how the collector represents OTIL data. Uh, OTTL works on how the collector sees the data, not how your back end is showing you the data. So some back ends may change the value of something. They might have special fields or, or uppercase things. That is not what OTTL is looking at. OTTL is looking exactly at what's in the collector. So when troubleshooting OTTL, you want to look at what the collector thinks of your data. So there's two ways to do that. The first is to add a debug exporter with a verbosity of debug. This uh, Add this to your exporters pipeline, and it will spit out exactly what the collector views as your data. So if you think that a field is sample rate with a capital S, but it's actually sample rate with a lowercase s, this would show it. The other thing to do, and something that's probably even better, is in your service telemetry logs level debug. We recently added to OTTL the ability to print out the transform context, which is essentially the what, what this group of statements is looking at. Uh, it will print it out at the start before any transformations have happened. And then after each transformation, it will print out what the data looks like now. So you can kind of go step by step and see, what did my data look like when I started? I've done a transformation. What does it look like now? I've done another transformation. What does it look like now? It's verbose, uh, but it is really truthful for what the data looks like. The collector also now supports exporting logs over OTLP as of the latest version. Uh, so if you want to push those logs to your favorite logs backend or whatever backend you want, to look, look at them instead of like console log or something, the collector supports that now. But when you turn on the debug mode, the log is going to flow in huge size. Yep. So you have to go one by one, one line by one. Yep. OK. That's, uh, that is true. I don't have an answer to that. It, it will turn on debug logs for every component, so you'll have to sift through. Got it. Uh, but they should come in order, uh, especially if you've just got the one pipeline, like, yeah. Uh, 
I ran out of time for Q&A, but if people have other questions that aren't examples, we can take that now and maybe they'll let us stay up here for a bit. Sorry, if I could ask a question. Um, I'm curious about what your development uh, methodology looks like for testing here. Are you running these tests in some sort of self-contained way when you write OTTL, or are you doing it end-to-end? -end? Uh, OTTL has a pretty extensive test suite. We have both unit tests for all of the functions, uh, all of the contexts, the grammar, the parser, all that stuff, the lexer, all that stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I asked the question badly. What I actually mean is when I write OTTL as a user in, in my configuration, how can I validate it? Oh, hmm. oh, 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 like when you're, when you're testing if a statement works or not. Correct, yeah. Um, do you want, I've answered I mean, a couple, do you want yeah, to Yeah, no, I mean, so, I mean, it's exactly what Tyler described earlier. So first of all, when you send your data through, um, the debug exporter is a big help because you can see whether it looks like you expect it to. And if you're having issues with that, then the second thing you can do is this debug level in the collector. So this will actually print out, like Tyler said, the whole context. So you'll see exactly what the data looks like before and after and determine whether your statement worked or not. When it comes to setting up input, when I do this, I normally do it locally. I keep it simple. I have like a file log receiver or an OTLP JSON receiver and just like really set up the data, only put the transform processor, only put the debug exporter. Um, there's some other, this has come up a little bit before. Someone has an issue open right now for something called the OTTL playground. Um, I don't know if you've seen that issue. It's the idea of, hey, Go has a playground where you can go and write Go code. What if we did that with OTTL? Uh, they made cool, like they made good progress on it. They had a website hosted for a second where you could go up and like write some statements and it was pretty sweet. So uh, there are some more like user-facing concepts out there right now for how to improve the, the like, experience with writing it, uh, but they're still underway. So for now, I think just running local collectors is a good solution. Have you done any investigation into static analysis for this? Like, into, uh, into what? Uh, any, any investigation into static analysis for the statements themselves so they can be validated before they're executed? Uh, we don't have any static analysis. Uh, I've always thought if someone wanted to make like a, okay. Out of time? Uh, we've always thought that like uh, doing like a VS code like thing that checked if you were writing the statement right like would be pretty cool, but no, we haven't looked into that yet. Thank you guys. Yep. Uh, I think we're done, yeah. Thank you.